thank you everyone for attending today our webinar, The Best Collaborative and Instructional Strategies for Supporting RELs. Before we get started, some brief words about our presenters. In our first segment, Diane Stair Fenner and Sydney Snyder will take an up close look at EL instructional strategies. Diane is the president of Support Ed, a woman owned small business dedicated to supporting English learners and their teachers. Her company provides professional development and technical assistance across districts nationwide. Sydney is Diane's principal associate at Support Ed, and together they've co authored Unlocking English Learners Potential which is Diane's third book with Corwin. In the second segment, Maria Dove and Andrea Honigsfeld will address teacher collaboration. Andrea is a professor and Maria an associate professor at Malloy College, Rockville Center, New York. In addition, they provide professional development on teacher collaboration and inclusive approaches for instruction and have published more than a half dozen books, including co-teaching for English learners. Stay tuned until the end of the webinar for details on special savings on all four authors' entire professional libraries. Now I'll pass our virtual mic to Diane and Sydney. Hi, this is Diane Steerfenner. Um, thanks for advancing the slide. So our objectives have three overarching objectives. The first is to understand the importance of scaffolded instruction. The second objective is for you to learn strategies for scaffolding content instruction to benefit our English learners. And the final objective is to explore strategies and tools for collaborating, again, in benefit of our English learners. And in our next slide, we will have a little chat for you to have you start thinking, oops, in the slide after this, I mean. So we're gonna get started and Sydney and I, my colleague Sydney Snyder and I will talk about scaffolding. So to begin with, in your chat, and I see a lot of you are using it to share where you're from, um, we'd like you to share for a couple of minutes, what do you think? What are scaffolds intended to do? We've got a couple of visuals here to help you guide your thoughts. Just jot down a couple of notes in our chat, and hopefully everyone can see what everyone else is writing. Um, I see a lot of you saying support, support and structure, support students when needed move from one area to another, help students access language and content, give support and structure, build, build confidence. confidence. Oh, thanks, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> They're going fast. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Great. Building so, on previous knowledge. Helping students reach their highest potential, allowing students of supporting concepts and eventually taking them away. Great, well, you can keep typing them in and um, maybe we can move to the next slide and we'll integrate some of your wonderful responses. But yes, so you can see that some of you have mentioned that scaffolds are temporary, so we wanna use them. And as our colleague Tanya Ward-Singer would say, we also want to lose them. And so uh, the goal of scaffolds is to provide students support as they're building English language proficiency. And as we remove them, as they gain proficiency and confidence in the language and the content, we'd like them to be independent in the future and completing tasks. So they don't need the scaffolds to complete these tasks. And we can look at the next slide. So why do we want to use scaffolds with English learners in particular? Um, we would like to be able to provide them comprehensible input and using scaffolds increase the amount of challenging complex input that we can give our English learners. Also, and very important now with increased expectations of our English learners, we can use scaffolds to give our English learners access to grade level curriculum and also scaffold assessment a formative assessment for our students. In addition, um, when we provide scaffolds for our students, we can model the language, the rich academic language we would like them to produce, and we can also encourage students to take risks when they're using uh, their oral and written language, their expressive language. And finally, we can differentiate scaffolds according to students' English language proficiency level so we can provide different amounts of scaffolds depending on students' level of English language proficiency. 
So let's look at our next slide. One more chat for you. And the, our question, our guiding question for you is, what types of scaffolds do you use with English learners in your classes? Or maybe what types of scaffolds have you seen or are you familiar with? And um, we'll just read off a few of them that we see coming in. Some of you are saying sentence stems, sentence starters, word banks, graphic organizers, modeling, realia, lists, front loading, instruction, using the mother tongue or the home language, using anchor charts, images, emotional scaffolding. Oh, I, I see a, a friend from our ELL chat book club overseas. I would love to hear more about that too. Um, acting, mind maps, well, keep them coming. And as you're still typing in, um, we're gonna advance to the next slide and my colleague, Sydney Snyder is going to continue. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. There's so many great ideas here. Um, so what are the different types of scaffolds? Based on the work of the WIDA consortium, we group scaffolds um, into three, three different groups. And often we tend to focus on the materials, what the teacher can create to support uh, his or her L's. But we also need to take into consideration the instruction piece and also student grouping. Depending on the task, our L's and their level of proficiency, our L's may need one or more scaffolds from each of these three categories. So it really is dependent on who our L's are and what they need. If you could advance, please. So let's talk a little bit about um, scaffolded materials and several of these you have named and we'll be showing specific examples of the ones that are bolded on the list. So some examples are graphic organizers, visuals, which could include pictures, realia, objects that students could hold in their hand, short videos, uh, word banks or word walls, you can see in the picture there on the screen, uh, sentence stems or sentence starters as they're also called, um, sentence frames, which be, would be a whole sentence with, with words missing and you might want to use a word bank with that, or paragraph frames, English or bilingual glossaries, and also supporting texts or materials in the home language. Thank you. you can. So let's start first talking a little bit about word banks and word walls. Here you can see uh, a scaffolded text that has a word bank on the side. Word banks can be used to support students as they acquire new vocabulary. Um, and similarly, word walls can be used to support students. Often we think about uh, using word walls at the elementary level where it might be um, like uh, words that high frequency words, for example, or words with different spellings, irregular spellings. But word walls can also be used at the middle school and high school level to show content level, um, content specific vocabulary or sequencing words. But the important thing to remember when we're using word walls is we really want them to be interactive. It doesn't help if we have a bunch of words on the wall that students aren't using. So how can you have tasks that really help students use those word walls? How can you get them involved in making the word walls, maybe including home language translations or visuals? Um, help make our word walls more interactive. Thank you. This is an example of a paragraph frame. And the idea with a paragraph frame is it can help students as in their writing. And you can see with this one, the, the teacher has included not only um, sentence frames, but also has included clues as to what the student might want to include. For example, insert literary device. Um, they, if you want, you could also do a whole, uh, essay, a whole essay frame, and gradually have fewer and fewer frames as you, as you move through the essay. So maybe the students get more support at the top, beginning of the essay and less as they work through because they can use the other paragraphs as models. Thank you. This is an example of a bilingual glossary. And when we're thinking about glossaries, it's really important to um, make sure, again, that it includes things that are gonna be helpful to students. So in this one, you see there's the word in English along with the 
translation in Spanish. An English definition, we really want to make sure that those are student-friendly definitions um, so that the definition isn't more complex than the word itself. An example from the text or the content that's being used to really make sure that it's being used in the context um, that's appropriate for what you're studying. A picture which the students could draw themselves. And then finally, you'll see that there's a column for cognate. And cognates can really help students become more autonomous vocabulary learners um, as they think about whether the word is similar in their home language. And we know that in some languages, there will be very few cognates, but in languages like French or Spanish, there will be a, a lot of cognates. So we see instinct and instincto there. Thank you. We can continue. This is an example of um, supporting texts in the home language. And when we're thinking about home language support, uh, it's really important to know your students well, because we don't want to be providing home language support, including translations, if a student has low literacy skills in their home language. Um, so here you can see an example of uh, Paul Revere's ride translated in Spanish and Animal Farm in Korean. So those can be a great resource for students who are literate in their home language. Um, and it might be a question of when, when would you provide these or how might you provide these? It could be something that you give to students and they take it and they can use it at home when they're doing their homework. Or another possibility is if they're doing group work, maybe they have um, a supplementary resource in their home language. Other ways of using home language would be during uh, discussions to allow students to, to speak in their home language in a small group if they all shared the home language. Um, and you could also let them do some writing in home language to get the ideas going. But again, it's important you need to, you really need to know the backgrounds of your students, what their home languages are, and also their uh, level of fluency in their home languages. Thank you. We're going to move now to the category of instruction. Um, and these are things that you can do either before um, diving into the content or while during instruction. So for example, you might want to choose uh, pre-identified or pre-taught or vocabulary for pre-teaching. So as you think about what you're going to be teaching in your lesson, what is the vocabulary that your L's might need to know? And you might want to do a pre-assessment so you figure out which students need which uh, vocabulary. Um, and maybe students, again, could be working in small groups or doing station work where they're working on different vocabulary. The concise uh, instruction of background knowledge. So um, I know someone talked about prior knowledge in the list. So really thinking about what your L's might need that your non-L's might already know. And it's important when we're talking about background knowledge, we don't want to give we don't want to give away knowledge that they are going to be able to get through the text or through the content. You don't want it to be a spoiler because we still want students to, to grapple with the text, to grapple with the content. But it's really important um, that maybe it's something like something that students have been learning about for a long time. So for example, maybe it's about President Lincoln or um, the Civil War, something that students may have studied uh, th that um, non ls might have studied since they were small, but our ls might need that really to dive into the lesson. So thinking about how you could teach that concisely, quickly, so you're not spending a lot of time on background knowledge. And again, it might be a homework assignment, it might be a station assignment. Um, and then the other, the last two are things that you might do during instruction. So think, really thinking about how, how you model all your activities, how you model language, thinking about when you're giving directions and instruction, how you might be repeating or paraphrasing that in different ways. Um, so that students have an opportunity to hear, to see, to see modeled these, either the instructions, the activities, the language. And then the other, the last bullet is really talking about how to teach academic skills using familiar content. So maybe you're going to have students compare and contrast 
to text? Could you start by having them use the language to compare and contrast with two things that might be more familiar, two sports, two hobbies, for example, so that when they go to do the compare and contrast with the two texts, they don't have both the lift of the task, the academic task, and the lift of the language. They've had some practice with the language first. Thank you. This is just a quick example of um, how you could might teach uh, background knowledge on the Mississippi River and it's from Engage New York scaffolding guidelines that Diane and I worked on with Diane August and the students in this it was a fourth grade text they were going to read about a man who cleaned up the Mississippi River and so in order to prepare the L's who might not be familiar with the Mississippi River you can see there's a map a um, a picture and a short text, including a glossary. There was also a short video that accompanied it. And again, it was could be taught very quickly so that students would have that background going into the text. Great, thank you. And here, this is a modeling checklist um, that, that again, when teachers are modeling, they could be modeling language, they could be modeling um, an activity, how to do a task, they could be modeling um, a strategy. So this is a, a strategy checklist, so different strategies, predicting, questioning, visualizing, and it could be something that the teacher is keeping track of, or it could also be something that students are listening for. They can listen for when they hear a peer make a prediction, or when they hear a peer question, or a student could use it as a self-assessment when they hear that, when they see themselves doing it, when they're using these keywords to do one of these strategies, they could keep track of that. So again, trying to really build student autonomy um, in use of these strategies. Great, thank you. And then the final category that we talked about is student grouping. So different types of grouping include structured pair work, structured small group work, or teacher-led small group work. And often when I'm doing professional development, teachers will add, ask me like, what's the best grouping? Should I group my all my L's together? Should I group L's of varying proficiency together? Should I group L's and non-L's together? Um, and the answer is, of course, it really depends on um, the needs of, um, it really depends on the needs of uh, what your task is. So for example, you might have you might have an activity where students are going to use a home language resource. So you'd group your those students together. Or you might have an activity um, where students um, where students, you want them to have language model for one another. So then you'd group L's of varying proficiency or L's with your non-L's. So really being intentional about, about your scaffolding. Um, and so right now I'm gonna turn it over. We can flip, flip the slide. And I'm gonna turn it over to Diane, who's gonna talk about uh, steps for scaffolding. Thanks, Sydney. Um, well, we definitely want to be cognizant of everyone's time to make sure that Maria and Andrea have uh, ample time to present. And then also we're going to have an overall question and answer session at the very end of the webinar as well. So in terms, Sydney just shared a lot of great strategies and you can find all of those um, with some more examples in our Unlocking English Learners Potential book that we co-authored. Um, and now I'll talk a little bit about some steps for scaffolding a lesson. And it's definitely an iterative process. It looks like five steps, but at the end of the fifth step, you would circle back to step number one. And the first step is to know your English learners. So knowing their levels of literacy in the home language, I saw a question about that on the chat. That's a very important information to know, knowing their English language proficiency levels, knowing what motivates them, knowing whether they're newcomers or not, for example. And then once you have a base of that information, you'll need to identify the language or skills that students need in the lesson. What will they be asked to do during the lesson? Do they have to identify or persuade or convince or have a discussion, for example? And the third step is to plan the lesson, ideally co-plan the lesson, as Maria and Andrea will talk about, um, with a content teacher or an EL teacher. And next, you have to select and develop appropriate materials. Are we bringing in home language materials, like Sydney suggested? Um, or are we sticking with the, the grade level English materials, for example, or a combination of the two? 
Um, and finally, we'll teach the lesson, ideally co-teaching the lesson, adapting and scaffolding the materials as you need to, and also reflecting on how it went, and then going back to step number one all over again. Um, can we look at the next slide? So what I'm gonna do is show you one tool for each of the first three steps. And you can find these in our Unlocking English Learners Potential book. So a tool that we've developed is to help you collect some information to share what you know about an English learner. And this should be shared with content teachers, with administrators, grade level teachers. Um, and it just provides a place to gather background information. You can do this electronically as well, for example. And next slide, please. Our second tool has to deal, has to do with then um, our second step in the process, identifying the language uh, skills that students will need for the lesson. So we provide uh, some guidance on how do you scaffold depending on the level of English language proficiency? What are some suggested scaffolds that you can use broken down by the beginning level, intermediate level and advanced level? of proficiency and then you'll also notice on the right side of the page we have scaffolds that we recommend for all levels and again we'd like you to use and also lose the scaffold so it's important to know when to integrate them and you can know depending on the what you know about your student you would use some of these scaffolds you can look at the next slide and the final tool that I'll share with you is a scaffolded lesson planning checklist that Sydney and I developed. And this is also from our Unlocking English Learners Potential book, page 74, if you're following along. Um, and we have, you can't see it all here, but we have 10 points um, that you can use together with content teachers and collaborating um, and also co-planning lessons just to see if you have some elements of effective lesson planning for that will benefit English learners. So we encourage you to take a look in the book and use these tools. And next, I'll turn it over to uh, Maria and Andrea. Well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview of instructional strategies. So now it's our turn. This is Andrea Honigstab. And this is Maria Dove. To talk to you about collaborative strategies that further enhance our instruction for English learners. Next, please. So imagine a very fancy camera with interchangeable lenses. So when you look at the same object using one lens and then you switch the lens, you're gonna see the same object from two very different angles. Next slide. We just heard from Diane Stair-Fenner and Sydney Schneider concerning instructional strategies and scaffolding supports for English learners. Andrea and I will now explore how to incorporate those strategies and supports for effective, for effective instruction for English learners through the development of collaborative practices. Next, please. So we frame collaboration or collaborative practices for the sake of English learners using the collaborative instructional cycle, which includes co-planning, co-teaching, co-assessment, and reflection. Each of these components requires a different set of collaborative skills to accomplish them. For this webinar, we will focus primarily on the collaborative practices needed for co-planning to support co-teaching. Next slide, please. So when teachers collaborate, whether they co-teach or not, there's a lot that they have to offer to each other. First and foremost, our own expertise of content, literacy, language development, pedagogical skills. Then we each have, as collaborating teachers, a vast amount of instructional resources, technology tools, supplementary materials that are scaffolded, tiered, and differentiated, as Diane and Sydney just shared. We also have our own bag of tricks, our teaching strategies that represent research-informed and evidence-based best practices, and finally, if you happen to also co-teach, you have various approaches to how to keep an open mind and willingness, willingness to explore various collaborative practices. Next, please. Depending on how much time you have to collaborate, you might have just once a month, monthly release time, or an opportunity to meet for an articulation meeting. You might be meeting weekly during your PLC sessions, 
or maybe even daily. So depending on what your collaborative framework is, you might approach co-planning very differently and use different tools and strategies. Next. Part of co-planning is having established good organization between or among the planning team members. Part of that organization includes having established curriculum maps, as well as what specifically need, needs to be taught, both language and content, by establishing unit plans. Here's one possible template for identifying the major aspects of a unit plan that's featured in our book. Next, please. In addition to unit plans, planning teams need to establish a system for reporting and sharing their joint lesson planning. Here are two examples of lesson planning templates. One is used for daily planning, while the other is used for weekly plans. Frequently, teaching teams establish their own lesson planning templates and share their plans via Google Drive, for example. We offer these templates to you as well as springboards for developing and improving on these templates. Next, please. So when you hear the word routines, are you thinking of something dull, unimaginative, repetitive, and uninspiring? Well, routines can be all of those, but what we believe in is that when instructional routines and collaboration routines, which we're going to talk about in a minute, are carefully selected and used with caution and intention, they could establish instructional practices that will be more effective and teaching that is more impactful. Next. So here is one example of how instructional routines support the co-planning process. This schedule reflects an actual routine I had established with one of my first grade co-teachers when I was an ESOL teacher. It represents a block schedule in which we taught in a first grade class for two periods per day. For example, we began our sessions every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with some kind of word wall activity. It was my responsibility to create and lead those lessons on Mondays and Wednesdays. On Fridays, we divided the class into two groups for a reteach review and re enrichment session. The routine established by this schedule reduced the amount of time we had to spend co-planning. We had already established a routine of how we were going to deliver instruction. So all we had to clarify was the what, what we were going to teach. Very often, we were going to teach, very often what we were going to teach was already established through our curriculum maps and unit plans. Next, please. So thank you, Maria, for sharing when you were an ESOL, ESL, ELL, ENL, whatever our title was at that time, <laughs> your, what your routine was. Interestingly, completely independent of each other, um, we also started co-teaching in the New York City Public School. And when I was a co-teacher, Sandy Schlaff and I established an instructional routine for our six-day cycle. As you could see in this diagram that Maria masterfully recreated from my sketches, <laughs> it's the sketch of about an 80-minute block period during which Sandy and I began the lesson with a mini lesson, a whole class instruction. After that, we broke up into two groups. She took a group and had a writing lesson with them. At the same time, I had a group and I conducted a reading, listening, and speaking type of a front-loading oral literacy sort of a lesson. After about 20 minutes, we flip-flopped. My group received writing instruction from Sandy, and Sandy's group came to me for reading, listening, and speaking activities. Once we have finished these two parts of our lesson, we broke up into centers. We planned six centers, which actually lasted six days, so our planning was very effective, not only because we had six different centers that the children rotated throughout the week, but also because this was our framework. This never changed. So the routine was not unimaginative or boring or dull. The routine helped us plan better and fill this framework with new content every week. Next. 
You know, it's interestingly enough, I was thinking that students often thrive when there's routines. Oh, yes. Especially uh, English learners, because they uh, don't have to listen and understand what's going on. They already know what's going to happen next. So routines really help to uh, create a safe environment for them as well. Uh, other types of teaching routines might be more generic in nature, yet teachers can establish particular strategies for opening a lesson, facilitating a lesson, and closing a lesson. For example, the lesson is opened with some kind of pre-assessment strategy or modeling, demonstration, or sharing new information. For this part of the lesson, one teacher might lead and the other teacher might, might teach on purpose, or both teachers might lead and teach the same content. Facilitating the lesson requires students divided into cooperative learning groups in which two teachers circulate the room and monitor student progress. And then closing the lesson requires all students to return as one group and both teachers wrap up the lesson and review. So there are so very many ways to develop routines for various content levels as well as the different levels of uh, grade level as well. Next, please. It is also important to establish roles and responsibilities as you discuss your plans for co-instruction. Neither teacher, neither teacher should be standing on the side of the room holding up the classroom wall while the other delivers instruction. Here we have established how two teachers might be teaching the same content to one group of students yet have different roles and responsibilities in delivering instruction. Establishing roles and responsibilities is key to instructional routines and consistently planned lessons. Okay. So just as important are routines established for shared co-planning time as they were for instructional practices. The most frequently cited challenge that co-teachers or teachers in general who work with English learners cite for us is the lack of planning time, the lack Absolutely. of opportunity to collaborate. So what we're gonna now continue with is sharing a couple of co-planning routines that will not necessarily compensate for the limited time, but would allow us to work smarter rather than harder. So the next slide will show you a co-planning routine turned into a co-planning agreement and a big shout out to Mara Berry in Kildare Country Meadow Schools in Illinois, who embraced with her co-teachers the idea that co-planning will be more impactful if we actually pre-plan each of us separate from each other before we come together for the co-planning period. And then after the co-planning time is up, which is often limited maybe to about 30 minutes or maybe 45 minutes a week, which is rather limited, if you think of it, post-planning will make it more effective for the team since after the meeting, when they prepare for the lesson, they will agree to who is doing what. It's a divide and conquer sort of a setup. The next slide is going to show a very different kind of co-planning. During this time, the co-teachers, even though, again, they only have about 30 minutes per week to meet, they break up the 30 minutes with, with a lot of discipline. They agree that only about two or three minutes will be devoted to calendar work, going over any kind of planned or unexpected upcoming events. 15 to 20 minutes will be devoted to looking at the five days coming up during the instructional time, what are we going to do and how are we going to deliver our lessons? And the last six to eight minutes are devoted to discussing individual students' needs. Whatever could not be accomplished during the 30 minutes will be then transferred to Google Documents and additional collaborative opportunities, which will be done electronically. I really appreciate this protocol. I what think do you it, like about it? I think it's important sometimes when we have limited amounts of time to have a protocol so we know what's going to be happening within a certain amount of time and really get accomplished what needs to be accomplished. So protocols can really be beneficial for co-planning. Yeah, so this is another shout out to Kildare in yes. Illinois. This is where we have first seen this type of a co-planning routine. Mm -hmm. Next. Here's another 
co-planning routine. And this comes to us from a middle school science teaching team in upstate New York. This team used to plan new lessons for five days. Every day, the students received a new lesson. However, they soon discovered that their English learners were falling behind. So instead, instead this teaching team only planned four days of new instruction, Monday through Thursday. And then on Fridays, they established a review and, and enrichment day. For those students who needed review of the week's work, they received it. And for those students who did not need a review, they received enrichment. This co-planning routine kept all students better on track, and it became very successful for them. Yes. You know what I like about it? What do you like about this it? This level of ownership. Yes. That none of these routines that we're sharing could and should ever be prescribed. And none of, none of our work actually is ever prescribed or prescriptive. Instead, what we do is we document success around the country, and then we cross-pollinate and bring it to the next place. Absolutely. They are all local solutions to the problems that exist, or the challenges, I would like to prefer to say, that exist within their uh, particular classes and schools. Next, please. Well, we've often heard about the lack of time, and, and this routine coming to us from an early childhood center really is a routine that's applicable to any grade level. So in this routine, the ESOL teacher only teaches her students Mondays through Thursdays. And on Fridays, the entire day is devoted to co-planning. She meets with individual teachers during their prep periods throughout the day. We have seen how really beneficial this type of co-planning routine is because what we know is although there is a great deal of success in co-teaching, the magic really isn't in the co-teaching. Yes. It's really in the collaborative efforts of the teaching team. So then would you agree that less is more? Less is more. So if they have four very well-planned lessons and on day five, there is no direct service to the children, then they would get more out of the four well-planned lessons. Absolutely. Rather than trying to do something you will never hear us, hear us say, so we're going to just whisper it, push in. No. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't use that term at all. So we do not want to see, we do not want to hear about pushing in. Instead, we want to see well-planned lessons. So, Lots of times push in. Um, you said it loud. Oh, we're supposed oh, to whisper it. Supposed to whisper it. Okay. Um, push and really uh, makes us think that it's it's just someone coming into the classroom and as the helper or yeah. assistant. Yeah. But with true co-planning, really, um, there's a development of true co-teaching. So, next slide, please. I think it's time for our little interaction. Even though we're seeing that the chat. A button is is heating up and flashing during our presentation we can't really read that at the same time as we are presenting but now we're going to invite you to answer our question it's a very simple yet very very complex question what makes collaborative partnerships work so we will give you a couple of seconds oh the words are just popping up so fast yes respect 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 mutual respect relationship teamwork trust willingness good listening trust is a big word flexibility professionalism mm -hmm. sharing open-mindedness flexibility commitment absolutely time to plan you still have to have time to plan you can just walk in there common goal we love vulnerability thank you vision i love that one compromise leadership oh we haven't even mentioned yet that yes sense of humor Absolutely. Coping mechanisms, uh, your communication skills. I think you're previewing our next few slides right yes, here. Yes, it seems that way. Okay, so keep them coming. I think we actually have a way to save all of your comments because we understand that you cannot see them. We can read all of your comments, but they're only coming in to the panelists. So thank you for your collaboration. We are ready to continue. We're going to talk about fostering communication strategies. So those of us, those of you who might have already heard us um, deliver some kind of workshop or presentation, you might have heard us say this, so please forgive us to repeat, but we like to assign homework to our participants, even though we're in absolutely no position to assign homework, 
especially virtually when you are not even anywhere near us. So here is the homework assignment for you for tomorrow morning. Or those of you who are um, in um, Asia somewhere and it's 6 a.m. and you're up and you're listening to us, well, thank you for getting up early, but this is your homework for today then. Please compliment your colleagues. This is the number one communication strategy we always talk about, which is we have to acknowledge each other, we have to foster a positive, supportive relationship, and one very, very powerful way of doing that is just simply give a compliment. Sometimes we like to talk about showering each other with compliments. Maria and I have been working together for 10 years, and even today, every single time we co-present co or do anything together, we're going to use the two plus two formula. Two things that went really well, and two things that we might do differently next time. So other strategies include I messages, I statements, paraphrasing each other, which will slow down the processing since I have to think about like, what did you really say? Did I hear you correctly? Positive, assuming positive intentions and pausing rather than responding immediately. Next, please. We also need to recognize that growth would not happen without some constructive conflict or some productive disagreement. So one strategy that we often like to use is a simple two-part sentence frame, which sounds like this. I notice, I wonder. So this way our noticings are objective, non-judgmental, non-evaluative statements that we certainly notice something that is going on either in our relationship or in the classroom or with our students. And the wondering positions these noticings as an opportunity for shared problem solving. It's rather than finger pointing what you did or what we should have or you should have or any of those other kinds of um, approaches to talking about conflicts or problems, we really invite an open conversation. Gentle honesty. Yes, yes. All right. Next. So for strong collaborative partnerships, teachers must agree how they might share control. So it needs to be negotiated in some way. So shared control can be accomplished by jointly establishing the norms of collaboration. This includes the process of sharing and openly discussing what we often call our non-negotiables, mm -hmm. those aspects of teaching that you absolutely need in order to deliver instruction and meet students' needs, as well as have a successful teaching partnership. Next slide, please. And trust. We saw trust come up on our uh, chat uh, box uh, frequently as we asked our question about what is needed for a collaborative partnership. Trust is an absolute requirement of collaborative relationships. It develops from sustained opportunities for collaborative conversations in which co-teachers learn to value one another. Without trust, any efforts to build meaningful partnerships will eventually fail. As trust develops and grows between two partners, their co-teaching becomes more productive, fully focused on the needs of the students rather than on uncertainties and insecurities of their work relationship. It is that focus that keeps the co-teaching partnership moving forward. And the last slide. So this is our happy place. <laughs> when we are working together, you might have already picked up on that. We're actually in the same room. I drove over to <laughs> Maria's house and we're sitting together as we share our final um, words of, um, I would say, experience, which is, creating an environment in which collaboration is the norm. When we recognize that no matter what experience or how much knowledge one of us would have, it's one plus one is always more than two. That together we reach that heightened level, levels of awareness and our impact is going to be quite different. So I think I would just publicly thank you for being my co-presenter, co-author, we co a lot. We co a lot. For 10 years. Yes, So this is have. a wonderful celebration for us. Thank you so much to Corbin Press for giving us this opportunity and also to collaborate with Sydney and Diane, which is a first for us to have such a shared 
collaborative webinar, and we just enjoyed it tremendously. We really appreciate the opportunity. And I think our next slide will be to open it up to questions. Well, I have a few questions. Uh, the first question is, when should newcomers begin grade level work? I work with fifth graders and um, I'm curious about this. Thanks, Jeff. This is Diane and um, I encourage my colleagues to, to jump in and for those of you participating to enter um, your thoughts in the chat as well. That's definitely a topic we are seeing more and more of in our work with schools and school districts and um, attending conferences and uh, webinars such as this. And it's, it's often tricky to determine when they should see grade level work, but Sydney and I definitely advocate for our students, for our English learners, equity. And we don't want the, to deny them access to grade level content, but we want them to have the scaffolds and supports that they need to be able to, to access that, that content. So um, we believe that they should be exposed to grade level content as, as soon as they come in. So they're aware of what the expectations are and also so that they're, uh, we'd also extend that to sharing that information with the families in a language and form they can understand. So they're aware of what the, what the grade level content looks like. But again, you know, we advocate for incorporating the scaffolds and support, some of which we shared in our presentation, so newcomers can access this content. Um, and, you know, again, in tempering that with bringing in materials at their level of English, um, at, in the home language, so they can have an understanding of the background knowledge of the vocabulary previewing some of that in their home languages to the degree possible that, that we can do. And I encourage, you know, Sydney and uh, Maria and Andrea, if they have any thoughts here to, to share as well. I agree with you, Diane. <laughs> Terrific, I have another question. How do we know if a newcomer is literate in their, in their home language? Um, this is Diane again, and um, I spent a lot of my teaching career in Fairfax County Schools in Virginia, and uh, one, one practice that we put in place, and we were fortunate to, and still do, have an entry intake or an entry assessment center, and when all English learners would come in, we would assess them, assess their level of English, those we suspected, or those who parents had filled out the um, home language survey indicating there was a language other than English spoken. And as part of the assessment process, we would give them uh, just a very simple picture, uh, have them choose a picture and write about it in their home language. We had writing prompts translated into all of the languages in the district. And that way, it was not a formal assessment, but we could get a sense of whether students could read the, the directions in their home language and also produce uh, some writing, some simple writing, looking at different kinds of pictures and images to write about an image. And it was a very quick way to get a sense of whether they did have some literacy skills or not in the home language. Thank you. I have another question. What are the differences between special education co-teaching and that model and the English learner co-teaching model? Because I have familiarity with the special education co-teaching model. Well, it's interesting that the special education model follows the collaborative instructional cycle of co-planning, co-teaching, co-assessment, and reflection. But the major difference between the two is that while co-teaching for special education includes content area instruction with scaffolds and supports for students with disabilities, Co-teaching for English learners not only includes content area instruction, but also English language development instruction with often some native language support along with scaffolds and strategies that are appropriate for English language learners. So that's the, the major difference between the two. Often the way we differentiate between the two setups is the special education co-teaching is frequently referred to as inclusion. The inclusive practices for English learners are often referred to as integrated, ELL or ENL. 
just to be a little bit clearer with the terminology. But that is not really consistent either across the country. We just like to differentiate that way. One final difference is that we rarely see co-teaching for English learners to be an all-day model. In the special ed context, we often see that at least for half a day or maybe for the entire day, the specialist is going to remain with the same group of children. So we face differences and challenges um, within the context of ELL co-teaching. Terrific, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, what are the differences when co-teaching in an international setting? Do you have any experience with that that you can share? Oh, sure. Definitely. I was born and raised in Hungary, and I've done some international work as well. So depending on which part of the world you are traveling to, um, the co-teaching in the international setting might be a native speaker and non-native speaker um, teacher being paired up, or um, a content-based instruction CBI setting. The focus continues to be on grade level content but the content is de delivered through the target language. I just recently visited Iceland and had a, a wonderful audience of about 300 people who were learning about co-teaching, but not the way we interpret that in the United States or even in many other countries. Their purpose was to uh, use co-teaching for capacity building. So teachers work together not for the purpose of language development or not for the purpose of literacy or even uh, providing coping mechanisms and, and um, scaffolds for some youngsters, but simply combining teacher expertise. Thank you very much. I have another question. Can native language texts be used when students are at the same proficiency level but they speak different native languages. Right, I, this is Sydney, I'll go ahead and answer that. So I think the idea with home language or native language texts would be to provide supplemental support for the student. So you definitely could get texts that are providing supplemental information or support for the content being studied in the student's home language and it could vary um, and it might, it just depends how you would use that. Would you have them use the text during while they were working on an activity, a support activity for the content? Would you have them take it home? Um, and really it would depend on your students um, and their needs. But again, it's very important that you know the literacy levels of your students in their home language to make sure that that's an appropriate support. Thank you. I have another question. How can we find videos in a student's home language. Any thoughts on this? For example, I'm looking for material in Arabic and I have, a, I have trouble finding that. There is a, a website called um, Culture for Kids and Asia for Kids, and that's not for Arabic resources, but other languages. And there's a whole range of multilingual resources available through that uh, publishing company. So it's Culture for Kids, Asia for Kids, and they might have some other um, resources or other links if you go on those websites. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. And I'd also like to, this is Diane, I'd also like to share that some great resources are through social media. So if you're on Facebook, the Advocating for ELLs Facebook page is a great resource, as is the Corwin Press, uh, the Corwin Facebook page. Um, and I'm finding that people asking questions on, on those pages often get a lot of very helpful responses as well. Perfect. Thank you. I have one last question. What should newcomers with zero English be working on as a starting point? Um, I think that it's important for them to work on language and it's important for them to work on content. So again, as Diane mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that they're, that they're being exposed to the content, but it needs to be scaffolded at their level and it's gonna take a lot of language in the beginning. I think I might add that this idea that there is ever a child with zero English is a little bit of 
a representative of a deficiency approach, and I hope I'm not offending anybody by pointing this out. So as an English learner myself, somebody who has studied six different languages, I always look at language acquisition as an amazing process, recognizing the brain's capacity to take in and process information in multiple ways, multiple channels, multimodal, multilingual, multisensory. So lots of things that we like to talk about is multi, this idea of uh, zeroing English points out maybe a, a huge deficiency or gap, but let's point out all the many, many things that this child can already process and understand. And if you think of it, there's no silent period in the brain. We might have this um, well-established term that the child is going through the silent period, but in fact, in the brain, the brain is never silent. We're always processing, we're always trying to understand, and there's inner mo monologue, maybe in another language, but there's always some kind of language processing and always some sort of um, understanding happening. I think also you have to begin with survival English skills, the skills that, students need to keep them safe in school, so the language that they need to know to get their needs met. And uh, so, so that's one thing I always would begin with, with, um, with students. And I, I think that it's very important for them to have, uh, to be safe in their environment. Terrific, thank you everyone. More, I can turn it over to you now. Yes, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, especially Diane, Sidney, Maria, and Andrea for what I would easily say was probably one of the most useful webinars we've had in these past three years of offering the free Corwin Monday Afternoon Webinar Series. I just wanted to remind you all that um, the entire professional libraries of Dove Honigsfeld and Venner Snyder are available at a special savings with a 20 percent a uh, 20% discount when you use webinar, uh, use the promo code webinars at corwin.com. You will receive your uh, PD certificates before the end of the week, as, as um, in addition to the PowerPoints themselves and the um, recorded session, which you're pre free to use, and I re I'd recommend that you use alongside the books in PLC or individual study. Ordinarily, I would give a special shout out to the um, East Coast for, um, you know, having sat, um, participated at this late hour, but special thanks too to Ecuador, China, Laos, and Canada, who are also represented here, which I think is a first for us here at CORD. But thank you everyone very, very much and um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.